So the first objective we're going to be making with you guys as far as these combination cooking methods today is a braised short rib. Now uh, it would help to back up just a touch and tell you guys what combination cooking really means and how we utilize it in the professional food service industry. Now combination cooking means that we're going to start with a dry heat cooking method which means uh, a, a saute or a sear typically. So we're going to use employ that dry heat cooking method to sear the outside of a piece of meat and then where the combination part comes in is we're going to finish that uh, piece of meat typically uh, but we can also do vegetables and fruit braises uh, but we're going to finish that product in a moist heat cooking environment so with the case of this short rib which is a plate cut and this says uh, this is boneless, so uh, it will kind of distort in shape uh, during the cook, but uh, this is a very tough cut of meat, uh, but they can be very rich and amazing if they're cooked properly, and utilizing combination cooking techniques is really the best way to get this really tough, uh, can be fatty, sinewy uh, piece of meat to be fork tender and a beautiful presentation actually. So uh, by starting with the high heat dry cooking method, which is gonna be getting a sear on this, we're gonna lock in all of that flavor and moisture. And then we're going to add the, the, the uh, exterior moisture, which is gonna be a combination of veal stock and red wine. I went ahead and marinated this overnight in red wine and aromatics, and that was our mirepoix, some fresh thyme, bay leaf, uh, pretty simple marinade, but I really want this to have that red wine flavor, so I did that marinade overnight in it. I've, I've taken it out of the marinade, I've patted it dry, we're going to get some seasoning on this and then get that really hard sear on it uh, and we really want to get this nice and dark and kind of crusty looking because we're going to develop flavor, uh, we're going to de uh, a really beautiful depth of flavor on it, uh, we're going to develop color which is super important and it's also going to seal in those that flavor and moisture uh, for the remainder of that cooking process. If we were just to put this in a moist heat cooking method and kind of simmer it that way, uh, it would come out rather gray and pallid, uh, whereas this way we're really going to get that depth of flavor and color that we're looking for, as well as the tenderness and presentation value from this really awesome cut of meat. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, salt and pepper on the outside of this product. And I want to be generous with this because as it's cooking, I'm not going to be able to go in there and check the uh, flavors on that. Uh, and a lot of it is going to kind of flake off or peel off during that searing, uh, but we got a way to keep that seasoning on there because we're going to go ahead and sear our aromatics as well. Flip this guy over, get some, some of this beautiful uh, flaky kosher salt on there. It really enhances the flavor of that meat, brings out the natural, uh, that just big, beautiful, beefy flavor that we're looking for from a product like this. All right, so that is done. We're going to take this over to the stove top and get this sear going, all right? So uh, if you'll notice, my saute pan is just about the size of that piece of beef, and that's really important. We don't want to have too much space in that pan. We want all of that heat going directly into that uh, short rib, uh, and you'll see what I mean. And then after I take the short rib out, I'm going to go ahead and saute my aromatics with a little tomato paste in a procedure that's known as the pincé, and that's just going to help add depth of flavor and color. All right, so I'm going to get my pan started on high. We're going to let that pan heat up quite a bit, and then we're going to add some oil, cold oil, hot pan. Uh, is the basis of a saute and the, what saute means in French, the translation is to jump uh, because of that sizzling noise that you hear and we really want to emphasize that, that really high heat application to get that nice crusty exterior on this product. So as this pan heats up, I'm going to make sure that I have tongs ready and a pan ready to put this piece in for the, for the last stage of the cooking. Want to make sure that our pan gets really, really hot, about to the smoking stage. And then we're going to add a little uh, canola and olive oil blend. This is a pretty standard uh, commercial blend in the kitchens. 
and I want to get about two tablespoons in there, enough to make sure that I get that good sear all the way around, all right? And this thing will render off some excess fat, so we'll probably end up with more oil or fat in the pan than we started with. And we need to be very careful when we're putting this in to that super hot oil uh, because it can flame up and you want to lay it in away from you. And you hear that sizzling right away. That's a really good sign that that pan is hot enough. And I just want to make sure that it's not sticking. So I'm going to lift it on the corners. Make sure that it'll move around freely in there. And I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that sear for probably six minutes on each side and then try to get those narrow end pieces and then take that out. Now we're going to turn this over and start searing these ends on here. I'm going to turn my heat down just a little bit so I don't burn my hand while I'm holding this up with my tongs. But you can see the beautiful color that we've got on this short rib. Uh, it doesn't take long if you've got a nice hot stove top. Um, but these are commercial burners so they, they work a little bit more efficiently than what you might have at home. Uh, but they, it gets the job done. It may just take a little bit longer uh, on a home model. And then after I finish rotating this through on the edges, I'm gonna get one, just finish the sear up on the top and bottom again, just to make sure we get every bit of it seared up. But you can see that really beautiful dark color that we've developed. Um, part of that is from the red wine uh, that we marinated this in, uh, but most of it is what is known as a Maillard reaction uh, where the, with the heat and uh, the meat, because uh, meats don't caramelize, uh, that's a, a misconception. Uh, they, the reaction that, is, that takes place is an enzymatic reaction known as the Maillard reaction, uh, and that's what gives meat that brown kind of color and aroma. It's a, just a very complex chemical reaction happening uh, between uh, the heat and the whatever protein. It is not caramelization. I'm going to get the bottom and then the top again real quick. Just want to push down on it a little bit just to make sure everything gets done properly. That looks beautiful. And we're going to do the top again because some of that fat has shrunk away. And we're just going to get that again. And you'll notice that that oil in the pan gets really dark. Uh, and it's, it may have a bit of a burnt flavor to it. So we're gonna pour most of that out before we start doing our aromatics. All right, that looks amazing. All right, we're gonna set this aside, turn that heat off, and we're gonna go into the pan we're gonna cook in. So that that oil that is pretty much spent and mixed with the uh, beef fat, I'm gonna pour most of that off. I'm just gonna keep enough in there uh, to saute my aromatics. And this is, I drained off the red wine from these aromatics as well. I'm gonna go ahead and put these uh, in as is. And that's how hot that pan still is. It, it is uh, screaming hot because the, the flame is not even on and you get that really good searing sound in there. So what I wanna do is just start getting some heat into those and I'm gonna add a little bit of tomato paste to this saute process, uh, which is known as the pincé. Uh, and we're gonna help add flavor and body and depth of, of color to this by adding this tomato paste and caramelizing it a little bit with these aromatics. Go ahead and turn my heat back on. And I've got a full pan here, so I'm gonna be careful not to spill any anywhere. We're just gonna saute this for a bit and then we're gonna add it to our short rib pan. And then we're gonna add our red wine and our veal stock to this uh, to finish out the braising liquid. 
Uh, when we're doing braising, uh, braising is typically done with larger pieces of meat uh, and that are cut down for service. Uh, and the other combination cooking method that we're going to be doing next is stewing. Stewing is typically done with bite-sized pieces. Uh, braising, you're only going to cover that item about halfway with cooking liquid. For stewing, you want to submerge everything uh, because it's more of a soup style uh, service. Uh, so there, there are some differences between braising and stewing. And you can find braised and stew items um, around the world. It's a great way to utilize tougher cuts of meat because it turns them into just really wonderful, tender, flavorful cuts or, or products on the plate. Uh, and these are extremely popular methods in the restaurant industry to utilize tougher cuts of meat that are often underutilized on, in the uh, retail sector. We're just going to cook this for a little bit. We don't want to cook this down all the way. We just want to caramelize that tomato paste a little bit and get all that flavor out of the pan into these vegetables so that they can continue to help flavor that short rib. We'll let that cook for a minute. So this mirepoix and these aromatics have been going for about five minutes on the stove with the tomato paste or the pince in there. And you'll notice that they've dried out significantly uh, and that, that that purplish color has kind of given way to a brownish red. Uh, and that's that tomato paste uh, getting into and coating everything and the caramelization of that tomato paste or the pincé starting to happen. Uh, and I don't want to do, develop that too much. I just really want to get that started. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and add my red wine. And this was two cups that I marinated in. Uh, and I'm going to get that hot. I just want to bring that up to a boil. Cook off some of that alcohol, that raw wine flavor, uh, and kind of mellow out this dish, round it out. I've got some hot veal stock ready. Uh, once this comes to a boil, I'm going to put it into the pan with our short rib, add enough veal stock to cover that product halfway, uh, and then I'm going to cover that pan with plastic wrap and aluminum foil to really create a sealed environment. And then I'm going to put it in an oven uh, at 300. 25 to 350 degrees for about two to two and a half hours. Now, that's a long cooking time, but this is a very tough piece of meat that will benefit greatly from that long cooking time. If you've ever eaten short ribs uh, that were undercooked, they're tough and rubbery uh, and very difficult to eat, so we want to make sure we give this plenty of time to cook properly. Now, you can use a pressure cooker for these or an instant pot. They, it, those items do great. Uh, a great job on this. Uh, however, in the restaurant industry, we usually have time to do this. Uh, and uh, this is the method that is primarily employed uh, if you're not going to use a sous vide method, which would take uh, a day or two. All right, so we'll get back to this in just a minute. Our wine is starting to come to a boil. Uh, and remember, I don't want to cook this wine down so much that we lose uh, that, that characteristic flavor of wine. I just want to cook off some of the alcohol uh, and that raw flavor. So we're going to let that heat up just a second longer, and then we'll get that into our pan. The wine has sufficiently boiled. And I want to show you this really quickly. Uh, we got a really beautiful color in here. Those aromatics are going to just continue to do their job. I'm going to pour this in the pan and then add my veal stock. Now, uh, remember the aromatics I have in here are celery, carrot, onion, uh, fresh thyme sprigs, and bay leaves. Uh, a really simple kind of classic marinade for this. Set that aside. I've got my hot veal stock here ready. And we're just going to ladle oh, about 12 to 16 ounces of this in here just to get a proper amount of liquid in there for this braise. And that is it. We're only, about, we're only covering that beef about halfway. 
uh, and that is the perfect amount for a braise. It, it doesn't have to be fully covered. So the next thing I'm going to do is cover this with plastic wrap. And plastic wrap can go into the oven. Uh, I always like to have it underneath uh, dishes like this uh, with foil on top of it, just because of the fact that uh, I don't want it to melt and tear from the top. But if there's foil on top of it, it, you, it, it will do really well in, in an oven up to about 375 degrees. So I'm gonna get my plastic wrap on top of this. Nice and tight. We really wanna get a good seal on this dish. And then some aluminum foil. So this will go into a 325 to 350 degree oven for about two to two and a half hours. We'll check it after that. And we will, uh, what we're gonna do, once this is fork tender, uh, which means we don't need a knife to cut it, we're gonna take that cooking liquid that is in there and we're gonna reduce it down. We're gonna strain it and reduce it down to make a sauce for this short rib. So let's get this in the oven and we'll get started on beef stew next. The next objective we're gonna be making with the combination cooking methods is beef stew. Now, we're, we're all, everybody's familiar with beef stew in one form or another. Uh, so for this, I've got a, three pounds of beef and I've got a little bit of beef round. I've got a little bit of beef shank and I've got a little bit of beef sirloin. So that's gonna give us a lot of different qualities. The, the shanks have a lot of connective tissue, so that's gonna add the richness to the, to the cooking liquid. Uh, the round has that big beefy flavor and texture, uh, and the sirloin has that really fine grain with that beautiful uh, flavor to it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my, uh, my diced beef, and these are about one inch cubes or so. Uh, I'm gonna get that. Sorry. Uh, I'm gonna get that into a bowl, and I'm gonna pour a, put about uh, half an ounce of oil on this just to coat it. That's about a tablespoon of oil there. Just to coat that so that I can season this product, and I'm gonna get some salt and pepper in there. And I wanna get this seasoned before I dredge it in flour. Now, uh, why am I dredging this in flour and I didn't do that to the short rib? Well, because I want this sauce to thicken up naturally on its own during the cooking process. And so by dredging this in flour, what that seasoned flour is gonna do is it's gonna create a roux uh, in the pan while I'm sauteing this or searing this beef off. Uh, that is gonna help naturally thicken that sauce uh, as this stew cooks in the oven. Now you can do stews on the stove top or in the oven. I prefer doing these uh, combination cooking methods in the oven. Uh, we're gonna go through one on the stove top with the chicken because it's fairly quick. But uh, the reason I prefer doing these in the oven is because the, it's a more gentle heat uh, from all directions rather than uh, just a high intense heat from the bottom. Uh, I think you get a better product out of it that way. So now everything's oiled and seasoned. Uh, the, the spices are all adhered. I, and he, I have seasoned flour. This is all-purpose flour with salt, pepper, paprika, uh, a little cayenne. Uh, and you can add to this whatever you like at home. So I'm going to put about half of this in there, toss it in, and I have a, a, a large mesh strainer. Uh, to get any excess flour off. I don't want to put too much flour into it uh, because what you can end up doing is thickening that, so that cooking liquid or sauce too much during the cooking process. And I'm gonna let this sit for just a second and let that flour stick on there and use this mesh strainer to get all of the excess flour off. That way I ensure that I only have what I need when I'm start searing the meat off, right? Just give this a good shake and all of that excess flour is going to just sift right out. There we go and that's ready. And 
my flour's back in. I'm gonna add the second half of this and I'm gonna start heating up my uh, Dutch oven. And what I'm using today is an enameled cast iron Dutch oven. Uh, these are becoming much more uh, affordable. Uh, I got this one for about 60 bucks. Uh, they're great to use because they're really heavy. They hold heat extremely well. They have great seals on them, so you're not gonna get a lot of evaporation with that heavy lid on there. And, and they just make a wonderful product. That They're also really nice to look at as well. Let me get my gloves off. And I'm gonna start heating up that pan. Now don't be alarmed if you have one of these enameled cast irons and they start to discolor after a while. Uh, that with normal use, they will do that. I'm gonna put that in here and go ahead and start sifting out the rest of my beef. So while that's heating up, uh, I'll get the rest of this beef ready. Uh, I'm only gonna do about half of this at a time. Uh, half of the beef at a time. I don't want to crowd it into that pan because what happens is the heat will dissipate and you'll get more of a steaming action than a searing action. Uh, and you definitely don't want that. You want this to get nice and brown and kind of crusty rather than gray and soupy. Uh, if so, make sure you are using enough high heat to get these objectives done correctly and don't crowd your pan. That's the, uh, nothing worse than that stew coming out uh, not browned properly, okay? All right, that looks good. So all of my beef's ready. Got my cooking oil here. I'm gonna give this thing another second to warm up. And while that's warming up, I'm gonna get a tray to put the partially cooked beef on. My pan is getting nice and hot. I'm gonna cover the bottom with oil, so I'm gonna use about two ounces down there. Give it a swirl around the pan, make sure that it gets into all the, gets into the corners. I'm gonna start adding half of my beef. And we're starting to get that sizzling happening right away which is good. And I just wanna cover the bottom of the pan without this stuff being in two layers. Just a single layer in the bottom, fill in any spots. And then from here, I, I don't wanna to touch it for a few minutes, I'm just gonna let the heat do its job. Uh, if anything, I might just give the pan a little bit of a shake just to ensure that nothing is sticking down there. And this will take a few minutes, but we should end up with a really beautiful golden brown, uh, deep color and aroma from this. It's gonna start smelling really nice very soon. So this has been in here for about four minutes and I'm gonna just start gently turning this. And you'll see we're starting to get some color on the bottom. And we want to get that color on all the surfaces of this meat. So we're just going to gently turn it. And let that sear keep happening. Give your pan a shake. And we'll check it again in a few minutes. So you can see this searing process is really advanced now, and we've got some great golden brown color in there. At this point, we can start taking this meat out and finishing our second batch. So I'm gonna use my slotted spoon just to get this into a holding pan, and we'll get the next batch started. And one thing you should notice is everything that builds up in the bottom of the pan, super important, we want that, what is known as fond, F-O-N-D, at the bottom of the pan. That's what builds all that flavor and color later on. So that's a valuable component and what we're trying to build for this dish.
And you can add a little more oil if you need at this stage. And I think I'm gonna add just a touch more oil so that we don't get any scorching, all right? That's about a half an ounce or a tablespoon. Put it in there and we're just gonna go ahead and dump the rest of our beef in there and get that going. And we'll come back when this is done and finish putting this stew together and get it in the oven. All right. Okay, so we've got our second batch of meat done. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and add the first batch to that. And we're going to do a pincé again, which is that caramelized tomato product. We're gonna get all of that back in there and all of the juice uh, and we're going to start with a little tomato paste and we're just going to let that get in there, get down and coat and caramelize uh, with the meat and the aromatics in the pan and we'll get those in next. First stir in that tomato paste and everything's really sticky in here and, uh, and just it smells amazing and it looks gorgeous. With all that meat has got that beautiful browning on there. That sear has happened perfectly. And we got a lot of buildup on the bottom of the pan, uh, which is gonna definitely help give some intensity and flavor to this sauce, uh, the stew liquid. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is add red wine. I got about a cup of red wine here. And we wanna cook that down to the almost syrupy stage. We wanna cook the alcohol out of it. Uh, we're not looking for the same flavor profile here that we had with that short rib. And you'll notice this, that pan, everything sticking to the bottom is starting to come up and thicken up, all right? So that is perfect right there. Now we're gonna start adding our veal stock. We've got, and remember, for a, a stew application, we want to get this completely submerged. And we're also going to add our mirepoix and aromatics. Remember, mirepoix is a mixture of celery, carrots, and onion. It's typically two parts onion, one part celery, and one part carrot by weight. I've also got a bouquet of thyme and a couple of bay leaves. We'll go ahead and get those in. Dump all of that in. And to finish this stew, I'm gonna saute some mushroom quarters uh, and put those in to finish it. And I also have some baby red potatoes that I'm gonna add to this uh, at the, when it's almost done. Uh, when it's got about 30, 20 minutes left to cook, we're gonna add those baby red potatoes and just let those soften up. Uh, it looks like I'm gonna need all the veal stock. Let's go ahead and get it all in there. All right, so that's about two quarts of veal stock. Now I wanna bring this to a boil before I put it in the oven, uh, just to make sure that it's hot enough going in. And I also wanna work this rubber spatula along the bottom of this pot to loosen up any of that fond that is still stuck down there. I wanna get it into the cooking liquid so that it helps add flavor and color. It's got a couple of sticky spots down there. You just gotta keep working at it with the uh, spatula and it'll all come up. Then we're gonna cover this and get it into that oven. Remember 325 to 350 uh, should be fine for this. Now, if you wanted to cook this for longer, just go ahead and turn down the heat to 300. Uh, this could be like an all day thing, or you can even at this point put it in like a, a slow cooker crock pot um, to finish all day but you, want to, you really want to get the sear on this product and cook down that wine some before you put it in a slow cooker. Starting this from, from the beginning in a slow cooker uh, would yield disastrous results. I don't recommend it at all. all right. So again, this should cook for a couple of hours, uh, probably two to two and a half hours uh, to thicken up nicely. At about you know, hour and a half to two hours, you want to open it up, put your potatoes in, start cooking your mushrooms, uh, and then just finish them with that. All right. 
So once this comes to a boil, going in the oven, two to two and a half hours. All right, our beef stew has been in for about two hours. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out. We're gonna add our red potatoes, put it back in for another 30 minutes. But let's take a look at it. All right, that looks gorgeous. The cooking liquid has thickened up significantly. And the little bit of starch from the potatoes is gonna help that as well. We're gonna go ahead and get our potatoes in. Get them distributed. And while these are cooking off, we'll go ahead and saute those quartered mushrooms. That'll be a beautiful garnish for the stew. Get this back in. We'll be back in a little bit with that finished stew. It's time to get our stew out. Let's take a look at that. It smells great. Let's ooh, look at that. Beautiful. All right, so uh, there's a couple of things we need to do before we serve this stew. One, I wanna get that little bouquet of thyme out of there and my bay leaves. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna get these on our guest plates, but they've done their job and done it well. So there's one, and I know I've got another bay leaf in there. Two, uh, awesome. There it is. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna add our mushrooms in. Now those mushrooms cook down quite a bit, but the, what they do is they add a lot of flavor at the end that really deep kind of sauteed mushroom flavor is gonna be beautiful. So um, to serve this, we just wanna get a nice bowl and we wanna make sure we get plenty of that liquid in there. And this is just a six ounce portion. Get a little bit more meat in there. Serve this with a beautiful crusty French bread. We'll go ahead and wipe up the rim of our bowl. So that is our beef stew combination cooking method. Uh, you can find different recipes uh, for stews all over the world. Uh, this is just gonna be one of those really hearty, satisfying meals, great in winter or summer. It doesn't matter, this is just one of those all around things. Very inexpensive because we're using a tougher cut of meat. Really flavorful and delicious. Enjoy making stew. So we've got our short rib ready. Uh, it braised for two and a half hours. I took it out of the cooking liquid and started reducing the cooking liquid. At the same time, I kept this warm. I, I put it, the short rib in a pan, covered it with foil. Let's go ahead and take this out. We, want, we need to be real gentle with this. I don't want to use tongs, so I'm using my trusty Pelton fish spatula to get that out. And this looks amazing. We're gonna go ahead and portion this out and I'm just gonna cut it four ways, and we need to be, it's just fall apart tender at this point. It is beautiful, and it, we'll get back to the sauce in just a second. It's been reducing, and I've been cleaning that sauce up, skimming the fat off of the top. And we'll get four portions out of this guy. We're gonna go ahead and get one of these on a plate, and it is just falling apart, it is beautiful, all right? So for the sauce presentation, uh, all I did was reduce this cooking liquid down to a, a, until it's nice and thick. We're gonna check the consistency of that now. And we have our saucing spoon. It could be just a touch thicker, so we'll leave it on for a second. Uh, over high heat, this doesn't take long because there's only a few ounces in there. We'll just let this reduce down really quickly. We'll try not to make a mess. Uh, and we wanna get this just a touch thicker so we get a nice sauce on there. But this is a beautiful uh, integral sauce, which is, means that it is made from the cooking process. 
Uh, it doesn't get much easier than this. Uh, just make sure if you're making a sauce like this that you skim all the fat off of the top and any, uh, any skim that forms. You really want to get that off of there so that you get a really nice clean sauce that's not fatty. All right. So we, so we got a nice syrupy sauce and it's going to be really rich with uh, red wine and beef flavor. Let's go ahead and sauce this plate. And I just want to lay this over the entire short rib like a glaze almost. And you don't want to use too much because as this sauce reduces it gets really potent, but you want to leave it you want to get enough on there to to give the meat a proper sheen and add the flavor of that beautifully reduced sauce. So that is your short rib. Let me show you that. Beautiful presentation. Uh, now in a restaurant, this would be, uh, you know, $30 a portion, something like that, just depending on what it's served with. But this is an amazing way to use an underutilized cut of meat. So the final objective that we're going to do for the braising and stewing or combination cooking methods is we're going to do some braised chicken quarters. And these are the chicken hind quarters. It's the leg and thigh intact. Uh, these are going to cook much quicker than the beef objectives. This should be an, uh, you know, around an hour start to finish. Uh, some of the flavor components that are going to go into this is I'm going to use lemon juice and zest. Uh, to brighten up the dish. I've also got a little Dijon mustard, some fresh herbs, thyme. Uh, we're going to use a little roasted garlic in there. And to finish this, we are going to put some toasted barley in. So I have about a cup of barley here. I'm going to put it in the oven, get it nice and toasty, and put it into the braise. Uh, I'm also going to finish this with some sauteed uh, tomatoes and summer squash. All right, so the first thing we need to do is get some seasoning on this chicken and just get some salt and pepper going on here. Uh, season both sides. And I like to wear gloves when I'm handling raw poultry, uh, just a, a personal preference. Uh, it just, I, I'm not a big fan of handling raw meats uh, with bare hands, especially poultry. So that's why I have the gloves on. All right, Get that nicely seasoned. Now remember with stewing and braising objectives, you really want to make sure that you get your seasoning taken care of in the beginning uh, so that you don't have to add so much at the end. Uh, kind of a season as you go philosophy. All right, uh, we've got our pan. I'm going to go ahead and start heating this up for our sear. We're going to do the same method of searing uh, that we did for the beef. However, because this is a skin on chicken, we need to be a little more careful. We're not going to look for that same kind of hard sear. Uh, we're just going to look to develop some color on this uh, so that that skin isn't rubbery uh, and nasty when this is finished. Uh, so it'll be tender and kind of add to the sauce rather than be something that you just want to take out of, it, of the finished dish. All right, uh, while the pan is heating up, I'm going to go ahead and zest a lemon with uh, my microplane. I'm going to use the juice and zest from one lemon. And th this is just three portions, so it's uh, pretty quick. We don't need a whole lot of ingredients for this. Uh, and this is going to be a beautiful summer dish. You can add any kind of fresh herbs you want, oregano, uh, rosemary. I'm just going to add a little bit of thyme and then uh, some dry bay leaf to this to help it uh, just get some aromatic qualities. But you can add anything you want to this. Uh, the white wine and the lemon in here are really going to help kind of perfume it, give it some acidity and brightness. Right? So, the pan's heating up. I'm going to get a little bit of oil in there. Get about at least an ounce down. You want enough oil in there uh, to coat the bottom of the pan. We'll bring our chicken over while that's getting nice and hot. And we got a nice shimmer on the oil, so it looks like it's ready. So we're going to get our chicken in there. We're going to start skin side down. Make sure it's not sticking. Give it a little, give the pan a little shake.
And this shouldn't take long at all. Uh, it's not going to take nearly as long as the beef did. The color is going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, if you, uh, one thing most people don't know is that uh, chicken skin contains a lot of gelatin, so uh, keeping the skin in here is actually going to help give the, the cooking liquid a little bit more body uh, than it would if it was a boneless skinless. But on the flip side of that, chicken skin is fatty as well, so this will have a little bit more saturated fat in it. So uh, it, it's a personal preference. I like using the skin. Uh, however, if you're watching the calories or whatever the case is, boneless skinless is perfectly appropriate for this. Uh, just be careful with uh, boneless chicken, it tends to dry out fast, so that's why I use the hind quarters for braising. But you could do this with a, a boneless skinless breast. Uh, you just need to be careful that it's not going to dry out on you. See a little color happening around the edges. Let's take a look. Ah, oh, nice. Just another minute on the skin side, then we'll flip it over, and then we'll start adding our aromatics to this. While that's sauteing, I'm going to go ahead and put this uh, barley in my oven and get it nice and toasty in a 400 degree oven for about 10 minutes, that, and that barley will be nice and fine. All right, good, nice. Just starting to get some browning going on. That's really what, where we want it. We'll turn this over. Give it a shake, make sure it's not sticking. So I'm gonna pull these out and drain off some of that excess oil uh, from our searing portion just so that this isn't a greasy dish when we're finished. We've strained off our excess oil. At this point, I'm gonna start coming in with our aromatics, and I'm gonna, I've got some mirepoix, celery, carrots, and onion. I wanna get this down in there. I've also got some, some of those quartered mushrooms that we used in the stew. Get all of that down in there. I'm gonna put some parsley, a good, amount of parsley. I love parsley with chicken and mushrooms. I've also got one of those thyme bouquets, a couple of bay leaves, and I'm going to put some, some of my tomatoes in just to help create sauce. And the rest I'll saute with the squash and get a little bit of roasted garlic in there. And finally, a little bit of mustard, a little bit of Dijon mustard. It's just going to help the wine and the lemon kind of brighten this dish up. Give this a shake. I'm going to go ahead and get my lemon zest in there. And I can put more lemon zest to finish this. Cut my lemon. Lemon juice. And you can also finish it with more lemon juice if you like that. Like that. White wine. And chicken stock. This chicken stock was frozen. Uh, so I'm going to have to kind of break it up in, out of the frozen chunk. It's pretty slushy right now. There we go. Get these gloves off. And we're going to let this come to a boil. Uh, now this objective, we're going to go ahead and just finish it on the stove top. Uh, once everything comes to a boil, and it happens pretty quickly, uh, even with the ice in there, uh, once this comes to a boil, uh, we're going to add our toasted barley in there, and everything should cook roughly at the same time. We're probably about 30, 
35 to 45 minutes uh, is what we're gonna look at as far as cooking time. So this is much quicker than that beef. This, the, the chicken is gonna come to temp and be tender and ready to eat much quicker um, than that beef. So let's kinda get everything stirred up a little bit, distribute those ingredients. I'm gonna put one last little bit of salt and pepper in there just to help everything along. And then we'll do the saute on the squash and tomatoes to finish this. And this will be a really nice kind of summer braised chicken dish. One pot meal. A little more salt and pepper. It already smells really good. So once that comes to a boil, we'll get the toasted barley in and start sauteing the squash and peppers for the finish. And then we'll take a look at this dish. Our toasted barley has been in the oven for about 10 minutes at 400 degrees and our chicken dish is coming up to a simmer. So I'm just gonna dump all this toasted barley in there. And you get that great sizzle from that. You s that beautiful, toasty, aromatics quality. Uh, it, now, if you're gonna do the toasted barley, you may wanna add a little extra cooking liquid uh, because that barley drinks up a lot of that liquid. Uh, I believe I've got enough in here. I'm, since this has come to a simmer, I'm gonna turn it down, put it in the back, and give it about 30 minutes, and then we'll check it to see if, if it's done yet. And while that's going, we'll go ahead and get our squash and tomatoes sauteed in our big saute pan. Get this guy nice and hot. We'll saute this really quickly and set it aside to use as a garnish on the finished product. We're gonna start this by getting some oil in our pan. We've got about an ounce of oil down there. Nice and hot, shimmering oil. We're gonna go ahead and start with our squash. Put that in there. Get some salt and pepper in. Get this nice and hot, then add our tomatoes and finish it with a little bit of fresh parsley. And that's basically it. and add our tomatoes now. Now, I, I don't want to get too much heat on this because uh, I don't want these vegetables to soften up too much. I just want to get the cooking process started so we have a nice garnish. Then add our parsley.
And I'll go ahead and add a little Dijon mustard to this just to build that flavor up, help it match what we're making in the pot. About a tablespoon in there. And get that stirred in. is our garnish, the sauteed squash and tomatoes with parsley and Dijon. We'll go ahead and get that out of the pan so it doesn't overcook. And we'll save this for our finished dish. So our chicken's been going for about 40 minutes. Let's pull it off the stove, bring it over and take a look at it. And, oh, beautiful. All right, let's get down here and uh, take a look at this. I'm gonna pull out the, uh, the little bouquet of thyme. We'll set this over here. Uh, sorry, find something to put this in. I got rid of all my stuff. How about a trash can? All right, sorry. Pull out the thyme and the bay leaves. We'll fish those out when they come up. All right, so there is our chicken. Uh, we can tell it's done. It's pulled away from the bone and shrunk up a little bit. So that looks good. And we've got this really nice creamy sauce going on. So let's go ahead and plate this up. We're gonna use our sauteed squash and tomatoes as the base. So rather than a starch like a rice pilaf or mashed potatoes or something along those lines, we're gonna use this vegetable as the base of this dish. All right, uh, let's get out a piece of our chicken. We'll kind of set that nicely on there. And we will get some of this beautiful sauce in there with the tomatoes and the mushrooms and the parsley. And we'll just kind of sprinkle that around the plate. Oh, look at that barley. That barley, that toasted barley looks beautiful in there. And we've got all those other aromatic veg, the celery, the carrots, the onion. This looks amazing. Get a little bit more of that sauce in there. And I'm just gonna finish this with just a touch of my leftover parsley. And there we go. So this is our lemon and mustard braised chicken with toasted barley.